Hello and welcome to this very special edition of the IPA's Looking Forward, a weekly podcast of debate and discussion about politics and ideas. For this very special edition, we have a very special guest. It's my great pleasure to welcome to the IPA studio a physicist, academic, author, environmentalist and stalwart defender of free speech on everything that matters. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. my great pleasure to welcome to the stu- IPA Dr Peter Ridd. Thanks very much. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Scott Hargraves, editor of the IPA Review, uh, joined as always by my looking forward co-host, Dr Chris Berg. Good morning, a- Scott. Great. How's the RMIT going? Yeah, really well. Really Good. That's a mandatory plug there. <laughs> uh, the IPA's Director of Policy, Gideon Rosner. G'day, Scott. Always good to be on Looking Forward. Great. Yes, and of course, many uh, listeners and viewers will uh, recognise Gideon's mug from his uh, live broadcast from uh, <laughs> uh, from a certain Brisbane courtroom. My uh, foray into gonzo journalism. Yeah, where some, <laughs> some uh, very historic events came to pass that we'll be talking a bit about today. This uh, Looking Forward podcast is brought to you by the Institute of Public Affairs. If you're not already a supporter, please do go to ipa.org.au and see how you can join or donate to support our research and podcasts like this one. Uh, our end of financial year appeal is in full swing, so uh, if you don't, if you want to lower your tax bill, provide a tax deductible donation right now, Chris. Peter, thank you very much for joining us. I thought what we might do is we might talk about um, uh, talk through your career and um, the, the issues that were raised and then um, uh, potentially some of uh, where you see the university sector um, uh, going now as someone who's had some very um, unique and interesting experiences and, of course, a long background. But, but first of all, l- let's start with this. How did you come to study the reef? How did you move into reef science? It was entirely by accident. Uh, I was uh, a physicist. And my mum saw an, an advertisement for a physical oceanographer at the nearby Australian <laughs> Institute of Marine Science. She said, you should apply for this. And I said, what's a physical oceanographer? <laughs> and uh, I went there and... Uh, After a week in a library. <laughs> that's right. And I said to the guy who was going to employ me, I have no idea about physical oceanography. He says, it doesn't matter. You're a physicist. You can pick it up. <laughs> and he gave me a whole pile of books. And within six months, I was a physical oceanographer. Oh, mm. fantastic. Mm. And, and, and you moved quite senior to in, uh, as a physicist and in the oceanography space. Y- yes. Yeah, so we, you know, over a period of many years, um, I, I'm really a physicist is really what I am. Uh, and I ended up being professor of physics at James Cook University and also working with the engineers and running them for a little bit too. Okay. And a lot of field research during that time. Yeah, huge amount. So I spent a lot of time on the reef, especially in the early days, uh, not so much nowadays, but uh, a lot of time on the reef. Is that is that something that has changed in the in, in in this space, or just because of your sort of senior roles and management, or or or, or is the nature of the science actually changed the practice? No, it's it's. Uh, I, I guess my role, um, I get seasick. <laughs> so, oh, you chose a terrible is, profession. Yeah, that's right. So, mm. um, so why don't we talk a little bit about um, uh, what has happened? And many of our listeners and, of course, many IPA members will be very familiar with um, uh, what's occurred in part um, because of the sterling work that Gideon, Gideon has been done. But we might, um, for the benefit of listeners who are coming to this story fresh, we might sort of hear about exactly what your first – skirmishes or issues in the academic freedom space were um, uh, and, and how that how that ended up with the Climate Change the Facts book published by the IPA? Well, it actually goes back a long way in, to things that most people don't even know about. My, my first skirmish actually was in, I think, 1997 or so when I made some comments about Pauline Hanson that she was actually a, a result uh, of university p- political correctness it was actually a uh, a response to that and i got into trouble for that <laughs> and uh but no no sort of big misconduct things i got into trouble and my head of department was told he had to counsel me and he just called me and said consider yourself counsel <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about other things so. <laughs> and uh, then i got into trouble for uh oh, probably about 10 years ago we, we did a lot of work on education and and I was saying that university education faculties were incredibly damaging with their so-called research, which isn't really research, and their influence on the way uh, education has gone. And I I sort of got into trouble for that. But then the big things, obviously, were the the reef ones, uh, where it was becoming increasingly clear that so much of the science was not properly quality assured. And um, there were these famous photographs, which supposedly showed a, a dead reef, and it just looked dodgy from the beginning. I asked a couple of my guys to go down there on their way to Mackay 
uh, check out these inshore reefs, see if there was coral there, and of course there was. And uh, I blew the whistle on that, but that was fairly unpopular. And you, you've published quite extensively in this space too. So this yeah, is yeah, that's right. So I've got over a hundred publications altogether. A, a large fraction of those are on the reef. Um, I'm actually the guy who invented the instruments to measure sediment <laughs> uh, movement on the Great Barrier Reef. Before that, we could never measure the uh, over long periods sediment resuspension on the reef. And of course, sediment is one of the things that's supposed to be killing the reef. Mm. So you know, I've had a I've had a career in that. On that, a, a number of people have asked us to ask you, um, talk us through the coral bleaching issue, because of course w we, we read about it in the papers, it's obviously a major political issue, particularly in Queensland mm. and even at the federal level. But it's not always clear, I think, to um, listeners or the general public about what, what specifically are the claims and, and how, how do those claims stack up? In your view? No, they don't. The claims go from anything like 33% of the reef died to 93% of the reef died. Uh, actually, when you bury down to the data during those that bleaching event in 2016, at the extreme, 8% died, which sounds like a lot. But when you consider that for the whole southern part of the Great Barrier Reef between 2011 and 2016, there was a 250% increase in the amount of coral. The 8% is, you know, it, it can actually recover from that within a year altogether. You actually look at the coral cover records, which have been going on in, in a quality way since 1985. Uh, there's about the same amount of coral now as there was in 1985. It goes up and down, mostly with cyclones, a little bit with bleaching. But my, my view on uh, uh, climate change and the effect on the reef is that of all the ecosystems in the world, in fact, the, the reef is the one best able to adapt to increasing climates, whether that's natural or whether it's anthropogenic. And, uh, so, you know, a half a degree uh, temperature change certainly doesn't cause mass bleaching events. These are entirely natural things. They occur whenever you have a hot year. You know, you get a hot year, your grass dies, there's a forest fire, it recovers, it's been going on since time immemorial. What, 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 it, just take us through though, um, talk to me like I'm an economist and don't have any idea of what's going on in these spaces. Hypothetically. Hypothetically. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what is bleaching? So, it, so how it, does bleaching it, actually... It, and uh, it's an important question because I think where this debate has fallen off the rails a lot is that um, uh, certain media outlets and, pe and certain groups with particular agendas, you know, have footage of... You know, ghastly looking white corals and, and uh, the case is frequently made that, you know, the reef is dying, look what's happening to it. But for the benefit of those who haven't read your great chapter in our book, Climate Change Effects 2017, um, yeah, took us through uh, the bleaching effect. All right. So a coral is an animal, a little polyp, you know, a little pot, pot of calcium carbonate. And inside that animal is uh, microscopic algae, which give it its colour. And it also uses the sunlight to produce energy for the, the little that coral animal. And there's, there's billions of these coral animals to make up a coral sort of thing. And what happens is that when the temperature gets very hot, or cold actually, it will just chuck out those algae, right? And that's bleaching because when that happens, the algae gives it its colour and it goes white. And sometimes it will die when it bleaches. Actually, most of the time it doesn't die. These, these algae are floating around in the, in the water and it will take those, those algae back when the, the hot water has, has, uh, has gone. So that's essentially what bleaching is. It's a bit like a bushfire. Sometimes a lot of, of coral does die, but it generally recovers very quickly. But if you actually look at temperature versus coral growth rate, in fact, the higher the temperature, the better the coral growth rate is. So the best coral in the world is in Indonesia mm. and Papua New Guinea, where the coral grows almost twice as fast as it mm. does in many parts of the Great Barrier Reef. So the general rule is the hotter the better. You know, if you want to see rubbish um, uh, coral, go to Sydney Harbour. There's corals in <laughs> Sydney Harbour, <laughs> but they're totally rubbish. Or if you want even worse corals, go to Scotland. There are corals in Scotland. And you may be interested to know that even those freezing corals in Scotland are supposedly being killed by climate change. <laughs> when obviously for corals, especially in Scotland, a little bit more warm water is only going to be a good thing. And that, in my view, is what will happen to the reef. Now, if you had a five degree increase in temperature of the ocean, well, that would be a disaster for the reefs. It would be an even bigger disaster for everything else. But generally speaking, for the tropical water, even with the worst case scenario, a one or at most two degree increase in temperature is all that you could expect. And the temperatures for coral can go right up to 38 degrees in the Red Sea and they're quite happy to deal with that. So this week we've seen uh, tourist operators from North Queensland complain that this scaremongering over the reef is killing their livelihoods. Uh, what would you say 
uh, about that development and about what this the, this irresponsible scaremongering is doing. Well, I think it's exactly what you'd expect. Um, you do hear it again and again, people expressing their surprise when they visit the reef. Oh, you know, we were surprised how good the coral was, considering we've seen all these pictures of it, of it being dead. Now, I'm not sure whether the downturn in tourism is entirely due to that. It could just be a natural... Uh, uh, decline and we're mixing correlation with causation there but this is why we have economists <laughs> that, that's right <laughs> well <laughs> but, but nevertheless if i kept if you kept on selling people that that sydney harbour the bridge was covered in rust it was falling <laughs> down the water was just full of litter and and junk you know you might expect a few less tourists to, in uh, sydney and i think the same is a pretty obvious thing that's going to occur in for the Great Barrier Reef. So let's let's move from there. Um, that, that's a really useful um, context because it's. Um, I think a lot of people have been wondering about that. But let's move from there about um, uh, how you how you shared this information and then how that that came to be such a big issue with um, your university. So so you published in Climate Change the Facts. Mm. Um, and and what was the what was the argument of the piece? Was was it precisely that? It and was essentially that that bleaching is Scott. <laughs> Scott is holding up a copy of the book for the film that's being made <laughs> right. right and, now. Uh, and we'll we'll link to where you can buy it, of course. <laughs> so it was essentially saying that um, explaining bleaching, saying that climate change, irrespective of anthropogenic or natural, is probably not a big deal for the reef, and but mostly that the conclusion was that we have a quality assurance problem with the science that essentially you can't believe everything that the big science organizations say which is a big which is a great shame and I said that on the Alan Jones show and that's what got me into trouble because I said that our science organizations the work that comes from them is untrustworthy which is what I believe because we simply do not have the quality assurance processes in place so Peter talk us through that because there, there were two as you said, there were two theses to your chapter in, in, our, in our book. Uh, one, that the bleaching effect is not necessarily, you know, proof that the reef is dying. But secondly, that the quality of science by, you know, a lot of your peers surrounding the Great Barrier Reef and the effects of climate change uh, can't be trusted. Uh, now, the counter reply to that will always be, oh, but it's all peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. This is peer reviewed science. How can you argue with peer reviewed science? Um, one of the things you been saying is that peer review isn't necessarily the guarantee of scientific authenticity that um, the, the protagonists of uh, reef scaremongering would have you believe. So talk us through that. Well, this is the, the thing that scientists will go on about peer review as though it's, you know, a dozen scientists pour over the work for a month <laughs> on end and they re repeat the experiments. This is what they, they, they give the, 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 the public this impression. And it's like a bunch of con men actually to, to, to say that because peer review is often and I've done hundreds and hundreds of peer reviews probably you know many hundreds of peer reviews mm. and most people like me you read the work maybe for a couple of hours you might spend a whole day on it usually not you have a quick read it looks all right you don't you don't can't do the experiments you're you're not being paid for it and that's peer review now this is not proper quality assurance and and they're finding that when you actually try to replicate peer-reviewed literature it tends to be wrong around about half the time. Now, getting it wrong oh. half the time, and when you don't know which half is wrong and which half is right, this is not the sort of this is not what the public expect. And the fact that that scientists will will claim that peer review is w not what it is makes me really believe that you know I, myself as part of this profession, I'm part of a profession that really is worse than a used car salesman. I, I sorry, I'm sorry Jeez. to say that to used car salesmen because <laughs> at least half the cars you buy from a used car salesman actually <laughs> drive. Work, right? work, yeah. you know, only one in probably 100 is a dud from a used car salesman. And, and I just want to stay on this, this point for a moment. Um, so what you're talking about there is it's got the, you use the phrase, uh, replication crisis. Mm. I find it fascinating that in Australia, I don't know anyone else who's actually calling this out. So you, you started with the interest in your field. You know, you've got skin in the game. You, you know, you, you're seeing it for yourself. You've done your own research. But you've also uh, linked to other research, um, including, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, an Ioannidis. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is unremarkable. Uh, at the mm. sort of meta level of science elsewhere mm. in the world. Uh, and perhaps give us a little bit of an idea of that, because I just find it remarkable that this is uh, uh, also part of science, that people are looking at this. But the moment 
say, a uh, certain Dr. Peter Ridd from Townsville actually starts to talk about this, you're a heretic. Well, this is the thing. I mean, since 2005, John Ionidis has been saying, a very famous paper, I think it was uh, entitled, Why Most F Published Findings Are False. This is one of the most cited uh, papers that's ever been written. And it's, you know, in the rest of science, it's completely uncontroversial that peer review is complete rubbish. Right? Mm. Uh, so, you know, the big journals, the Royal Society um, are saying we have a problem here and we need to try to deal with it. Now, I don't think that they're, that they're really fair dinkum about what the total implication of this is, but at least they know there's a problem. So what I, I actually didn't really know about it until five years ago. Uh, and when I started to read about the replication crisis, so many things gelled uh, in my experience. And I just wondered why I hadn't worked it out. Uh, a lot longer but no it's it's uncontroversial in fact and it's going through i mean so it started in um uh, biology and it's gone through psychology with really devastating yep. consequences yep. for that field but any area that does particularly stig is statistical significance tests because you can run tests multiple times and only report the one that um, mm. uh, that gives you the answer you want just throws the whole concept of statistical significance out the window mm. but turns out is is precisely follows your incentives because you as a working academic and myself as a working academic we need to get stuff published for our careers for our standing in the profession and so it doesn't matter whether it's true or not just as long as it looks significant or looks interesting and the only thing preventing us from just outright being misleading is is a sense of guilt or just a desire to search for the truth and all that sort of stuff that's right because there's actually very little consequence to a scientist being wrong i mean i've written multiple papers i actually took it on myself a, about a decade ago just to, when a, an important paper came out that i thought was wrong i'd spend the time a lot of time to show why it was wrong and i then publish a paper saying this is why it is wrong and some of these papers are not just wrong they are just fairy tales that's the only way you, you could describe them but there is no there's not there's there's no comeback on the scientists for making these mistakes <laughs> for example these reefs which were supposedly dead and you know on websites all around the world in in annual reports well the reef wasn't dead we've got pictures of it showing there's great coral in that region it doesn't matter at all it's like water off a duck's back that they're wrong whereas if an engineer makes a mistake there are dead bodies in the mm. wreckage of the aeroplane, right? So this is the problem. There are no consequences, especially in the environmental sciences, to being wrong. In 30 years' time, we may, uh, you know, you know, the, the crown of thorns starfish for the Great Barrier Reef, this has been going on for 50 years. They've been predicting the death of the reef from crown of thorns starfish, right? People are starting to cotton on only now. There are no consequences to scientists being wrong. We've got to make sure there are. The process even, sorry, to, <laughs> I'm going to back you up mm. entirely because the process even selects against those consequences. So it's very, very hard to get a replication, successful or unsuccessful, published. So you're not going to spend your time trying to replicate mm. other people's studies. It, it's worse than that. You actually <laughs> can't get it funded. I tried. <laughs> yeah, I, of course. I, yeah. I, I tried to, um, through the Australian Research Council, to... Um, to put in a replication study. And it wasn't just that it didn't get through reviewers, which is what I expected. The reviewers actually said it goes against the funding rules for the Australian Jeez. Research Council. Yeah. And it does. I then read it yeah. and I thought, oh my goodness, they've got me now, <laughs> you know, because it was true. It has to be new work, new science, and replication is not new work, even though it's fundamental to the scientific process. If you can't replicate it, like Newton's laws of motion are replicated millions of times every day, we can rely on them with our life. If you can't replicate it, it's actually not science in the and first place, and we don't fund replication. And I think I've heard you say, um, Peter, elsewhere, that uh, it's not like you're trying to turn uh, the entire scientific establishment upside down, um, you know, maybe tilt it at a certain angle, but, but I think I've heard you say something like, even if you just took 1% of the funds yeah. that flow towards this new but uh, unreplicable uh, sort of science and, and, and alarm, funding alarmist claims and rewarding that kind of research. If you just took 1% and yep. applied it to quality assurance, imagine what you could do. That's right. Similar to most industries, you don't normally spend more than 1% or 2% on quality assurance. But I, for the reef, for instance, the, this whole word quality assurance actually was, was a bing moment for me. when In a conversation with Russell Reichelt, who was the head of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, and he'd got into trouble for supporting the Adani port, the Abbott Point. 
And I rang him up and, or emailed him, I can't remember which, and, I, and he said, we've certainly got a quality assurance problem. And I asked him the question, how many papers would we have to, to check to, you know, that it's all based on? And I was thinking 20, and he said 12. Only 12 papers, that, and everything else is... And this is to do with sediment and... Yeah, yeah. and source. everything else f- cites that. Everything and da, da, da. cites yeah, that. Yeah. It's mm. like an inverted pyramid. If, yeah. you, if, you, if you top away the boat, that everything else falls down. So I reckon of the, you know, the $440 million that the government's recently announced to save the reef, if you spent 1%, 2% at most, you could actually check those, um, those fundamental papers and some will pass... Uh, I suspect most wouldn't, but um, but you know that's just that's a, that's the discovery. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So so normally when you publish a book chapter at a university, um, you you'll record a, <laughs> in the or book for that a, yeah, has Scott Hargraves. Uh, normally when you publish a book chapter, you'll report it to the university and go into some research system. And normally if you do a media appearance, you know it'll come up in a media mentions list mm. or something like that, and then like you add it to your CV or whatever it is that you do, whatever that's important. What happened in this case after you published with the IPA and went on Alan Jones. Uh, well, I got a, a phone call from the dean saying that I had to report to see him. Uh, For congratulations, I presume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then I saw the dean and he handed me a, a brown paper envelope and told me that I was um, up for serious misconduct. And um, and then it went from there. On what grounds did he originally make that 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 claim? Uh, because that I had been uncollegial or I'd broken the code of conduct or whatever because I'd said nasty words. <laughs> Um, essentially, because I'd said untrustworthy, that the institutions were untrustworthy and that the marine biologists were emotional, which I I firmly believe is one of the problems which we've got. Though I was actually saying it um, because Alan Jones had said, oh, these marine biologists, they're just in it for the the grant money. And I said, no, 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 they actually believe it. Don't don't tell them that they're corrupt because they're mostly not corrupt. You know, I don't know any marine biologist who's doing it just for the money. Those marine biologists who actually think the reef is buggered really believe it is, right? But they're emotional. Uh, so anyway, I was done for both of those and we decided we would fight. But these, sorry, to, to, to roll back, yeah. but these were, these were, you were being uncollegial to colleagues in your school or... It, at a- and at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, even though I didn't name anybody by name, I said the two organisations, the Australian Institute of Marine Science and the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Research. Which and, and for the benefit of our listeners, uh, those two bodies are affiliated with your employer or your former employer, James Cook University, yeah, so that was, the, that was the issue. That's right, yeah. Um, so, so where did it go from there? So, um, obviously, you decided to so we, fight we, it. Well, well, just before, just before we, we talk about the fight, did at any point did uh, any of these higher ups who were putting you through this disciplinary process did they actually refute your substantive complaints about no. quarterly assurance? No, and they never even asked. You know, bloody hell, Peter, what were you saying this for? You know, <laughs> it sounds like a pretty harsh thing you said. Um, let's have a chat about it. It was no, nothing like that. When mm. I could have explained, well, you know, the, you read my chapter. Of course, they've never read it. In fact, at the first, they didn't realise that that what I'm going on about is quality assurance of the science, right? Not just the science. I'm not just saying the science is wrong, but there is a fundamental quality assurance problem because they'd never even bothered to read my papers. But I've also got papers out on this as well. They thought that I was just criticising the science when I'm going into much more. But no, it was just big stick. We're going to uh, whack this guy as hard as we can. But you're allowed to criticise the science, yeah? And I should be allowed to criticise the quality assurance of Absolutely. the science. Now, now, they're saying you're allowed to criticise the science because I have been doing that and they have allowed me to do that. But now I was going to the heart of the matter, and this is really a dagger at the heart of this whole thing, that actually the problem is the quality assurance. And if the quality assurance is wrong, then by definition it's untrustworthy, even if in the end it turns out to be right, right? If you can't... If you can't demonstrate that you've got a process which will give some measure of you know uh, reliability then that is no longer trustworthy but I, I, th- that is such a weird distinction from the university's perspective because mm. i mean most academic disputes it's it's not obvious from the outside but most academic disputes are methodological ones yeah. They're about process. Did you use the right model? Did you use? Um, did you uh, include the correct tests or not enough tests or or anything like that? When you are con- when you are contesting 
what we're calling quality assurance, that's you're really talking about method testing or well, arguments well, about that. Well, right? we are, but you see, so this is a far more dangerous argument to those on the other side because up to then I'd been arguing, you know, sediment doesn't affect the reef for this reason or whatever. Okay, but now I'm going to the heart of the problem that because they can ignore a person uh, if they're talking about the details of the science. But because we were sheeting it back to the replication crisis, I think they could really see that this actually is true, that there is a, a massive problem here, and that was one of the motivations of uh, why they wanted to come down on me pretty hard. But even so, I mean, so you are protected as an academic by something that we amusingly call academic freedom. Um, everything that you have said would be, I think most of our listeners would associate that with within the realms of academic freedom. And, and Judge Vasta agreed. Yeah, and, and, and the judge, which we, of course we'll come to, um, agreed. But but why did not, why didn't they say, why did they say it wasn't covered by academic freedom? Because I'm certain that you would have responded like, hold on, I've got academic freedom. Yeah. Uh, yes, they said you've got to obey the code of conduct. <laughs> so they put on top of the academic freedom the code of conduct. Now the code of conduct, I'm sure that if I looked at you like this, yeah. That's aggressive, right? Yeah, yeah, and, I'm, and I'm, we're going to have a discussion after yeah, this. Okay, yeah, okay, all right. Uh, the snowflake but, but, but literally, is snowflake right <laughs> there. Snowflake. Literally, that code of conduct is so loosely written that almost anything you do that's going to cause you know, a bit of an argument is going to break the code of conduct. So they've got you over a barrel if, if you're going to have to follow, follow the code of conduct. So in the end, the, the court case was, does the code of conduct override academic freedom or, or vice versa? Now, of course, the, uh, the university was going to argue academic freedom is subservient to the code of conduct. And once again, for the benefit of our listeners, um, the technical nature of the legal dispute was that your right to academic freedom was in the enterprise bargaining agreement, which was effect, in effect your employment contract. Yep. Uh, and again, the the JCU administration layered over that a code of conduct with all sorts of rubbery obligations, including, for example, being collegiate and uh, res respecting the integrity of the universe and, and good reputation of the university. Now, you cannot by definition protect at all costs the reputation of the university and point out the science is wrong. It's just impossible, I would think. Well, this is precisely it, but that's what the university was arguing. Yeah. Mm. So, um, looking at the, the judgment, so we'll, we'll move to the court case itself, but the judgment has just a massive litany of accusations from the university. And obviously, mm. there was... Um, uh, there was a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of um, disputes that built up over the course of, of um, these academic misconduct processes and procedures and so forth. But um, there's just I'm, I haven't got the number on me. Something like 16 accusations or something along those lines. Well, altogether there was over 40. 40. Okay, that's right. They sort of gelled it down to a nice, <laughs> nice round. That's nice. <laughs> um, um, just an extraordinary litany of things which the um, uh, the judge in this case threw out every single one of um, in a rather devastating judgment for, for James Cook University, certainly to a layman's view. But um, I'd like to sort of talk through some of those, if that's okay. Um, uh, one of the things that I found the most interesting, and this is purely from my own personal perspective, is the claims that to have written in a book published by the Institute of Public Affairs that constituted a conflict of interest. Now, I raise this because I'm hosting a podcast <laughs> <laughs> at the Institute of Public Affairs right now. <laughs> Look, we, we, we could never understand that one. I mean, some of the things you could at least understand what their argument was even. But this one you think, well, I just don't understand the argument. How do we even almost respond to this? <laughs> Yeah, I, I was offered, you know, I think every of the authors of those was offered a couple of grand or so to write a chapter, right? A I bribed a couple of grand, you're obviously well, referring well, to. Well, but, but I didn't. I, I said, no, no, it's my job to, to write. I said, no, I'm not going to take money uh, because I never do, right? Not from, not just because it's the IPA. I mean, I'd, I've done a huge amount of consulting work for the university, literally probably at well over $10 million in my career. And I've always taken the view, and I could have taken some of that, I could have done some of it on the site. I've always taken the view, I will never do that. I'm just going to work for the university. It makes life simple. So we could just never understand what the argument was. And the, in fact, they, in the court itself, they sort of almost seem to withdraw. Yeah, if, if I could chime strange. in, that was one of the, the, the for lack of a better word, funnier aspects of the, mm. the, the hearing, which was great le high legal drama anyway. But th when it came to the point about conflict of interest, the judge was just exasperated. He just could not – this this poor bloke who was the um, barrister for the other side and had to run this argument, 
uh, was sort of dancing around it, and and no, no matter how hard the the ju- judge Vasta tried, they couldn't produce any reason why. Um, writing that chapter in that book constituted um, a conflict of interest other than the fact that you know perhaps the university just didn't like the IPA didn't like the cut of our jib but doesn't it doesn't it speak to well, let me give you a hypothesis doesn't it doesn't it speak to um, a claim that it wasn't just about the conflict it, it wasn't just about um, uh, the code of conduct or anything like that they were actually frustrated with the content of what you were arguing because the IPA would have had a reputation as a organization that's more open to debating climate science and this is obviously a um, climate science book or a book about the policy and science behind climate change um, to to claim that to write uh, the claim that writing for that is inherently a conflict of interest does tell you that it's it's not just about the code of conduct it's actually about your views on the science of Coral bleaching. I think that's definitely true, and the, and also on the, the quality and, and everything. That despite JCU saying, "What's the quote?" That we will fight until we're blue in the face for his academic freedom, um, <laughs> which is clearly not. And then they got blue in the face, and they stopped. Well, I mean, the, in the end, um, they were arguing that what I said was not an acceptable thing to do, and that who I was talking to or whatever was was not acceptable. And the judge threw it all out. Yeah, I mean, there's a big element in academia that you are the person, you as an academic, are treated as responsible for the um, places you choose to publish. And mm. they'll encourage you to publish in um, top journals and so forth. But by and large, there's a, um, it, it's part of the ideology of academia. There's a trust that you're an academic, you're a working academic, you know your field better than anyone else on the planet, or maybe better than, you know, there are four or five people who could judge your work. So you get to decide how you communicate that work, how, um, who, what organizations you'll work with, what industry partners you'll have, and so forth. And um, it seems like the university sector is, certainly in your case, trying to st- start to override some of those decisions and say, well, you know, you can you can publish with who you want, but not the IPA. I mean, that's a different well, thing. Well, that, that's right. And, of course, the IPA has got an appalling reputation within the university. One of the most interesting... Funny and, about and, that. And, yeah. Hard uh, one. A hard one appalling. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, one of the most disgraceful things was when I went to see a very senior academic basically to ask to build a bridge between me and the VC said look we've got to talk we've just got to talk we cannot slug this out in the media so before we went to the GoFundMe I wanted to get a a bridge to talk and I mentioned to her that I was working well well, no she knew that the IPA was involved at that stage because they'd paid for some of my legal fees a few thousand bucks she told me that was a terrible mistake that I should never have taken the legal assistance from the IPA. And I said to her, but nobody else was helping me. Mm. The union didn't help me. You didn't help me. None of the other academics helped me. And so the IPA come along as you seem to view them as some sort of neo-fascist <laughs> organisation. But all they're interested in here is is free speech. And they gave me a few thousand bucks. And you're telling me that I was not supposed to take the only help that was on offer to me at the time. It's just an incredible situation. And that would be, I don't think that would be right through the universities, but there certainly was great disquiet. I've been told, you know, we we think that what the university did to you was terrible, but we do worry about the friends you keep. Mm. But that is extraordinary given the sort of um, uh, issues that were in dispute in this court case, particularly... um, provisions that you were supposed to stay silent to everyone, including your wife, mm. if I'm right. But even worse, that but when I then mentioned the fact that they had done that to me, they then hit me with yet another misconduct allegation for supposedly lying about so the you fact. Had, you had to be silent about the fact that you'd been told to be silent. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and my, right. fa- my personal, model. My I, per- I personal favourite, when you, when you forward one of those outrageous emails on, saying, quote, for your amusement, FYI, they hit you with a, a no satire direction. Yes, that's right. I have, I have the no. There will be no satire. <laughs> <laughs> you. It's no, staggering. No, yeah. uh, just be, sorry, Chris. I will just interrupt your flow slightly because you alluded to the um, the GoFundMe campaign and that that initial um, support, which then resulted in the GoFundMe. Mm. Um, apart from anything else, Peter, as um, someone watching all this, I mean, that was the response to that. Really does restore your faith in people that. Uh, here you were uh, being criticised for, oh, you know, don't be friends with them, you know, probably being told, you know, just keep your head down. 
uh, the response to that GoFundMe campaign just tells you there there are thousands upon thousands of people out there who do believe in academic freedom, who do understand the issues. And are very grumpy with the universities. I mean, I remember talking with John Roskin because we didn't know what was going to happen. It was a heck of a risk. and Because one of the problems with it is as soon as we went to the GoFundMe, JCU were going to come out with a great big stick. And so if we <laughs> fail to get the funds... <laughs> You know, I would have been fired, and we had no. We did. We thought well, we might get five hundred bucks. Um, we didn't even dream that it would be the first one would be over in two days, and the second mm. one would be over in three days. No, just remarkable. A lot of people listening. Uh, mm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right. So, absolutely, so, y- um, so I do commend to um, uh, listeners the judgment itself. Given how absurd some of the claims that the university made against you, Peter, um, and the rather devastating approach that the um, judge took to some of those mm. claims. But I, I, I want to sort of move us forward to talk about what you've learned. So this has been an incredible, deeply personal experience for you as someone who spent your, your career in academia. Um, what, what, what do you now know about um, the university system that you didn't know before they made these claims? Well, one thing I do know, and this is a a bit of a shame actually, is that most academics actually don't really care about academic freedom. Um, Most academics are doing stuff that's uncontroversial, or if it is controversial, they are on the politically correct side of the controversy, Mm. and so that they really don't care. So there'd only be one in 500, one in 1,000 academics that really care. I think what's been what I've learned most about this is actually since what followed the judgment, the reaction of the university, no contrition, no mm. regret, and even worse that the one of the university organizations, their industrial sort of organization has come out on the side of the university. So they're still arguing against academic freedom. To my knowledge, none of them have signed up or have agreed that they will sign up to the the um, Chief Justice French's um, review on, on academia and academic freedom. Uh, none of them, as far as I know, are doing that. So what I've learned is that the university system is just utterly and totally in need of massive reform and I but the problem is I have no idea how you do it (laughs) Um, we might talk about that in a moment but I I do want to say my understanding is that the um, National Tertiary Education Union was very supportive of you yes they were um, uh, and and listeners might be interested to say that there there was a union actually backing yeah they they were backing me they they, I mean I might have been a bit harsh before the the union said look we don't have the money Mm. Um, to do it. And I understand that they didn't have the money because there's only about 20% of academics are in the union. And IPA listeners, you're going to all be really disappointed with, or some of you will be. But I've been a union in the union since the beginning. And I would encourage all academics to join the union, right? Now, we need to sort out the union. Well, it sounds like this is one union that actually is doing what it should do, well, which is sticking up for its members. Yeah, in this case, it, it does. And um, This is a world I mean, first that, for the Looking Forward podcast, I have to say. <laughs> there's, there's other things that the union does which I think are a bit crazy, um, but, but if you're a member of the union, you can at least influence it. Um, so, yeah, academics, join the union and, and get them to make sure that the – the code of conduct does not override ac- academic freedom because in Sydney University, I think it actually is the other way around. Yeah. Right. So um, uh, you, you mentioned the um, Robert French inquiry into mm. intellectual freedom at universities and free speech on campus and yep. so forth. And um, we've spoken about this a couple of times on the podcast um, already, but the, the French inquiry recommended um, uh, found that there wasn't really a free speech crisis on campus, but it, that um, each university should adopt a voluntary code of practice or, or something along those lines on freedom of speech um, and, and academic freedom and so forth. Um, a, a, how, do you, how do you sort of see your experiences tying into that, that bigger debate that well, we've been well, having? I think it, it demonstrates there actually is a crisis. And the way you can tell there's a crisis is the reaction of the universities, that they have all decided, as far as I can tell, that they're not going to adopt his thing. Now, that then, that then by definition, to me, is a crisis. Mm. You see, for every Peter Ridd, there's another few hundred of people who would dearly love to have said something, mm-hmm. but they're just not prepared. And then they see Peter Reid and say, oh, well, Peter Reid won his case. Oh, I'll now stick my hand up and say something. I don't think so, <laughs> right? Because yeah. they're going to say, well, I would need to get $260,000 worth of other people's money and, you know, and, and go through that. So they're not going to – they will see my case as not 
uh, as not being an indication that, that academic freedom exists. It's actually that academic freedom definitely does not exist, is the, the lesson that should be learned from that. And the reaction to the universities of the French is, is an, another example of that. Do you think, though, that as a result of your win, there might be, particularly those who are covered by an academic freedom clause in their EBA, there may be some loosening of that dynamic, some more academics who might come forward and... No. No. <laughs> no, no, no the, the, the lesson is absolutely clear. You might be able to get your job back. And remember, there's a great deal of... We're not even sure whether I will get my job back, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. It's probable I won't because, the, because normally in these things, reinstatement is not the one not that's given, right? So I probably won't get my job back, mm. right? But maybe there'll be some compensation that we'll, we'll make up for that. But the lesson that every single academic is going to get is that whatever you do, don't do what he did, right? And unless we have essentially a revolution within the universities, which may start with this French thing, but we've also got to deal with vice chancellors who clearly don't understand what they should be doing, uh, universities will continue on as they are and the other people, and there's plenty of my ilk, will remain silent because it's the only sensible thing to do, especially if you've got a mortgage and you've got kids. So what do you think's driving this dynamic? I mean, look, if I was a vice-chancellor at a university and I understood at least theoretically in the abstract the importance of having of making the university over which I preside a free speech zone, why wouldn't vice-chancellors be chomping at the bit to introduce a code of conduct immediately and show that they were committed to academic freedom. What What is it about the university sector that's working against that? Well, they just fundamentally don't believe it. Yeah. It's right. just as simple as that. They don't believe it. And it doesn't matter how much damage it does to the reputation because JCU's reputation, especially in North Queensland, has taken a heck of a, uh, a beating. And even that, they they don't believe in, in intellectual freedom. They they see Peter Ridd as being supported by some murky hmm. neo-fascist organisations, uh, climate deniers, and they believe that they are on the side of the angels. They really do. Mm. They really believe that they're doing the right thing. And it doesn't matter that they had to do disgusting things like you know, uh, reading emails and all this type of stuff. It was just a necessary evil. It's like having to bomb the Germans in the Second World War. <laughs> you might have had to have killed a few million civilians, but if you take out a few factories, it, it justified the, the, uh, what had to be done. Mm. That's uh, essentially, I think, the, the mindset of the universities. Right. You, you, you mentioned that the first time that you came um, uh, in, into trouble on um, public commentary, mm. you, you just sat down with the dean and you just had a chat. Um, well, it was more than a chat. I was pretty cross with the dean at the end of it, but I now look back at that as the good old days. It's quite pleasant, <laughs> and, you know, yeah, tea and <laughs> bickies right, and all that yeah. sort of thing. Um, uh, so, but, but obviously this, this was much more a brown envelope across the table, mm. HR um, oh, yeah. representative standing in every corner of the room, that sort of thing. I mean, that's, that itself is indicative of a huge change in the university sector, T isn't it? T total, because, I mean, what would have happened 20 years ago under the similar circumstances is that I would have been spoken to, and if they'd started to do the bad things, the professoriate would have got together and said to the VC, what on earth do you think you are doing here? You know, you can't do this. But what's happened at universities in the last 20 years is that the administrators have taken all the power and the mm. professoriate is, doesn't have any power. You know, when I joined JCU, the professor of physics was an important person with a, with a budget who would talk to the VC, you know, every couple of weeks or every month. Now at JCU, and most universities are like this, the professor who runs chemistry, physics and maths all combined doesn't even have a budget, right? He's so mm. detached from the vice chancellor, you know, by five levels of administration that they probably only see the vice chancellor at the graduation ceremony. And they have no power. The professoriate, the academia, no longer has power in the university. And that is a fundamental change uh, that's occurred. How does, how does that bureaucratization or, I mean, the, the left often call it a corporatization or something like that, the neoliberalization, how does that, how does that affect the intellectual climate? Well, it means that everybody is now scared, that, that if, the, if the academics uh, are scared, they're scared of the next round of redundancies, especially at JCU at the moment, um, they know that they have no power, they know that, um, that the administration can be quite brutal, um, it means you pull your head in. It's as simple as that. You're never, going to, you're never going to grumble too much. You're certainly not going to do the sort of thing that I, I did if you've got any sense in your head. I mean, you, you sort of said that you weren't sure exactly what reforms 
would would help. But I mean, to answer something like that, so in Australia, there's there's a lot of confusion about we, we don't have tenure in that American traditional sense where you can't be sacked except mm. for incredible business reasons. We we are um, all I'm I'm employed on a temporary contract, but most people are employed on a permanent contract if they're a full time academic employee. Do we need some sort of um, uh, change like that? Do we need to impose some sort of tenure or some sort of formal protection or? How do you think about those questions? No, I, I don't think that would necessarily work because, you know, I, I don't know whether that's the solution. I think the fundamental problem with the university is that almost from top to bottom, it's full of the same type of people. And we've got to get more genuine diversity of views in the universities. I think a certain type of person is attracted to academia and we need to get other people in there who t have different views and would be probably more likely to stop some of these things. But the federal government does have a part to play. I mean, the French Review is, a, is certainly an important thing. That, you know, it means that the university just can't make any rules willy-nilly. They're, you know, responsible for giving millions and millions of billions of dollars and they need to be able to make some rules for these universities, which um, at the moment they're not doing. Yeah, and, and the very idea that the federal government might have some influence is, is itself challenged, even though, as you say, uh, that's the source of much of the funding. It, 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 yeah. It, and uh, just to the thing about academic freedom, so Gideon was uh, reported on much of this uh, in terms of um, how that was brought out by uh, Stuart Wood, uh, mm, acting for you, Peter. Uh, and then picked up by Judge Vasta, so that this is not something that's just a bunch of um, uh, people sitting around in a studio talking about it, it's something which has a long heritage, it has real meaning, um, but we only find it activated in enterprise bargaining agreements. Mm -hmm. Now, credit, again, to the, to the union for ensuring that it was, yep. but that is not a safe home for no. such a fundamental principle, no, and that's really what French is about to me. That's right. I mean, one of the things that I keep on going on about is that we were saved by 13.3 of the Enterprise Agreement, right? Mm. That was what saved us. Now, 13.3 now has been removed, right? Wow. Now, I, th I think that the... In the latest the union, Enterprise yeah, Bargaining Yeah, at, at JCU, but it's worse at Sydney. It's already worse at Sydney. So, Jeez. I mean, I, I have sympathy for the union. Um, you know, they're supposed to be doing a lot of things, and academic freedom is one of many. They're worried about people's jobs. And so if there's a bit of pressure on 13.3, which is what we relied on to a large extent, um, then, you know, maybe it goes. It shouldn't be up to a union to defend academic freedom. Precisely. It, it strikes me that there's a deep interaction here between research funding and um uh, and, and the structure of the university, not just at an le at individual level, but you seem to have come up against some relationships that JCU had that really were um, the key to their reputation and key to their um, interaction with federal research funding bodies like the Centre of Lex Excellence for Coral Reef Studies at JCU, the Australian Institute of Marine Science, also a key stakeholder of JCU, um, uh, and, and even the um, Great Barrier Reef Marine Parks Authority. Um, mm. uh, it was was a lot of what you think going on just that interaction between you know federal relationships, the reputation of the university, and you as a little gadfly trying to trying to destroy that happy that happy space. I I'm actually not so sure that it was about money for JCU. I, I mean, I know a lot of people say that, and there may may have been a bit of a motivation there. No, I think that a couple of the characters high up in the university, including the vice chancellor just hated everything about what I was saying and that they believe that they are acting on a point of principle. If you were, if you were a young academic now mm. um, uh, wanting to work in, in the space of marine physics or, or just anywhere, what, what advice would you give, assuming that you, that person didn't just want to get along and just have a happy, quiet career, if they, if they actually wanted to pursue the truth, if they wanted to pursue research, how, could they do so? How would they no, do so? What it's would, just not possible. Hmm. With that incredibly optimistic, uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> you just couldn't. I mean, look, I've I've advised some of my PhD students when they're writing a paper and they want to get to that last paragraph and say, "This totally proves that the reef is fine; it's not being killed by sediment <laughs> or whatever." All right? And I'll say, <laughs> "Just hang on." Guys, no, the answer know. is more research funding <laughs> is needed. Yeah. Yeah. The, the the answer is more nuanced than that. Yeah. You know, and the more that I'll say, "No, just remove that." Right? It's bad enough that my name's on the paper and that you're associated with me. Um, that you just can't afford to do that at your stage of the career. I mean, I've often said, and there's an element of truth in that, this, that 
I, I didn't deliberately go out to get myself fired. But on the other hand, I probably knew I was prepared to take a higher risk because I'm closer to my retirement than I would have been if I was in my 40s. And if you're, you know, a 20-something PhD student, you would just be absolutely mad to do the sorts of things that I've been doing. This is particularly the case, I think, because we've got such a wild overproduction of PhDs as well. So, Well, it certainly doesn't help, but even if that wasn't the case, um, it would just be a mad thing to do. Mm. I was just going to say, which, which brings back amongst the uh, uh, many things that need to be tried, including French, is um, if it's while we're fixing up universities, um, there is this, uh, this parallel structure around the institution's uh, the opportunities uh, for quality assurance, to contest. So th that, that massive flow of research funding, if we can't um, fix science within the, uh, straight away within the institutions, within universities, um, one of the other levers governments do have is to, is to, uh, to protect the integrity of science, is, is to make it more contestable. Yep. And you in the past have talked about different measures, the... Um, uh, there was a lot of talk out of the US about blue teams, red teams. Yep. Um, uh, uh, President Trump is now setting up his own council of advisors. There's, there's different models out there. So, but uh, what excites you about those opportunities? Well, well, I mean, there are two big problems here. One's the universities, one's the science organisations. They're mm. both equally hopeless, actually. But I can see how you can reform science because, in fact, it's already starting. And, um, I mean, I'm saying that the government should have uh, essentially an audit uh, team that runs through the Auditor General's department, not the Science Department, right? That would take those 12 or 20 papers on the reef or on the Murray Darling or whatever and actually sub sub subject them to proper peer review. Mm. And you could do this very quickly. Um, of course, the chief scientist probably is not terribly keen on that because they're still mm. in a bit of denial about what the replication crisis means. But I'm actually very hopeful that we can actually turn this around on the science, the science institutions, but the universities. You know, I can't, I can't see. Yeah, it. yeah. Let's let's start with the easy stuff like mm. fixing science, and then, <laughs> yeah, and then we'll get to universities. Yeah, we'll circle right. back and fix universities. Yes. So. Mm. No, uh, Peter, this has been absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, all the best with uh, the next steps in, uh, in your battle. Um, we've all been following it with tremendous interest and, and know that you have friends all over Australia who are uh, getting behind you in this um, uh, in spirit, uh, if not even more directly. So um, thanks for coming in, mate. Well, thanks, and thanks for all those people who have helped and even just friendly emails. It's made it all the difference in, in this battle, actually. No, brilliant. And a uh, big thank you, as always, of course, to my fellow panellists, uh, Chris Berg from RIT University, Gideon Rosner, live from Brisbane. Well, sorry, live from Melbourne in this case. <laughs> uh, and also our, our wonderful team, James Bolt and uh, Saul Muscatel. You've been listening to Looking Forward, a product of the IPA. If you want to join or donate, get around our end of financial year appeal, ipa.org.au. We'll be back with one of the regular episodes of Looking Forward very soon. Thanks again, Peter and all. <laughs>